Of the more than 7,000 languages spoken throughout the world today, only a fraction have an established place in global mass media. Two-thirds of the world's seven billion people speak one of these 12 languages. Many of the thousands of indigenous languages, including hundreds in North America alone, are in danger of disappearing, as fewer and fewer native speakers continue to learn them. It's estimated that more than 60% of North American languages are spoken only by elders, and a world language goes extinct every two weeks. Author and language preservation advocate John Smelser is one of less than a dozen speakers of his native language, and wrote his language's only dictionary. When I first started college, there were about 120 speakers of our language. Ten years later, that was cut in half to 60. Ten years later, by about the year 2000, that was cut down to 30. By about 2010, cut down to about 15. Right now, there's 10 or 12 of us left. Smelser says language is a key part of indigenous culture that ought to be protected. I speak German, therefore I am German. I speak Finnish, therefore I am Finnish. I speak Swedish. And so language becomes a key identifier. What are we when we lose these things? Who are we? In North America and throughout the world, there are efforts to preserve indigenous languages through journalism, mass media, and new media technology. The World Indigenous Television Broadcasters Network was founded in 2008 to help indigenous journalists collaborate and share knowledge and techniques. The World Indigenous Television Broadcasters Conference was held in November 2016 in Sydney, Australia, hosted by Australia's Aboriginal Television Broadcaster. The conference featured broadcasters from Norway, New Zealand, Hawaii, Scotland, Taiwan, and many others who converged to share techniques and knowledge about how to better produce indigenous television and media. Communication professional Jennifer David was instrumental in creating the Aboriginal Peoples Television Network in Canada in 1999, which continues to bring programs by indigenous people, often in their native language, to audiences across the country. It takes a lot of time and effort, and you really have to be committed if you want to learn your language, and then if you want to figure out how to use that language and develop video and audio and, and do television or journalism in that language, that's then the next step. So I think if you step back, the issue is really there are just not as many people who are passionate enough about wanting to learn the language itself, and then among those people who are willing to learn the language, they're not the people who are then going to take and use that language in broadcasting. There are even children's programs to bring the languages to young viewers, but some programs have trouble making it to the airwaves at all. The Inuit Broadcasting Corporation was starting a really innovative children's programming in the Inuktitut language, and basically it got bumped, uh, you know, the day before they were supposed to launch, which they had promoted widely. And it was bumped for, at the time, in the 80s, some visit to Canada by President Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, so all of these Inuktitut-speaking, you know, children with their parents and grandparents were gathered around their TV to watch Inuktitut language children programming, and they saw Ronald Reagan instead. From stop-motion Cree-speaking children in Canada to a talking reindeer in northern Scandinavia. Smelser says children's programming is part of the key to keeping languages alive and getting young people excited about learning their native language. But even with these kinds of efforts underway, building an audience for these programs remains difficult. You have such small populations, such small audiences, that's an important thing. Why would you have a, a news station when there's no one to listen to it? So. I think the only way these will work is start to band together, band resources, band finances, band broadband, and to try to do what you can to promote just what I was saying earlier, media in your native language. The Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma produces a monthly program called Osseo that is broadcast around the region and online that focuses on Cherokee history and culture. Are the voices of the Cherokee people. Internet-based communication technologies are also empowering indigenous journalists by reducing costs and increasing reach. Former television journalist Rick Harp has produced a podcast called Media Indigena since 2010. 
The show focuses on indigenous issues, news, and perspectives, and Harp says he hopes to eventually branch out into shows in his native Cree, if he can find a listening audience for the content. But that would be something I would absolutely love to do, more actually about educating people how to learn uh, and how to speak the language. It's kind of a chicken or egg thing. Something I've definitely had to think about is what comes first, uh, the, the content in Cree or Cree speakers and to listen to the content. And, and of course, they're, they're inextricably linked. Harp says it's important to recognize that indigenous media need not be one-dimensional or pedantic and should be both accessible and fun. Uh, one thing we've definitely had to, to draw on uh, is a sense of humor. So I'd like to see more indigenous comedy uh, emerge. I mean, I, I think basically anytime you can hear someone like you on the air, as it were, uh, it, it's, it's always a, it's a good thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing that allows you to feel uh, comfortable in your own skin. To be an Indigenous journalist, sometimes it can feel like a, a bit of a crutch or it can feel like a bit of a millstone. Other times it's absolutely imperative, I think, that you foreground it. So I have no issues with it, uh, by and large, except when it's applied to me in a reductive way. For Global Journalist, I'm Jonah McKeown.